Hems, edges, and seams. We're going to discuss a few different types of commonly used uh, connection joints that are used in a lot of our sheet metal fabrication and what you're going to be seeing uh, a lot of in the um, construction field in uh, sheet metal. So for sheet metal, every single piece of sheet metal has to be connected in some way. Okay, those pieces such as ductwork, your downspouts, your washing machine housings begin with a flat piece of metal. We now take that flat piece of metal and make it into a shape, a pattern, so to speak. Your patterns are of the stretched out piece are transferred or made directly on to that flat piece of metal. Now, in order to make a piece of sheet metal and make sure that it connected well, we have to make sure that that pattern has what we call an allowance. Okay, it's an additional piece of material. Okay, so that we need to make sure that we can create our hem, a seam, or an edge. Because we have to have some way to make these pieces connect together. So in order to do that, we actually have to put on there what is called an allowance. The amount of allowance on this piece of metal is determined by, one, the thickness of the metal, the radius of the bend, okay, if we're trying to bend it, and the type of bend that's going to be made. Once we have that piece of metal laid out on that metal piece, we can now cut it out. We're going to use our sheet metal tools, our reds, our yellows, our greens, okay, bulldogs. If we have uh, some high-tech cutting equipment, yeah, we can use those things. Okay, so your hems, seams, and edges they are a very, very important part of the fabrication process when it comes to making sheet metal. They join the opposite ends of the patterns to make a complete piece. You'll find in, uh, in the HVAC industry that we have to, in some cases, make pieces of sheet metal or pieces of ductwork in two pieces in some cases, or sometimes even four. Depends on the the piece. We can make some uh, rectangular square ductwork in one piece if it fits on the metal that we're using. We may have to cut it out into several different forms and then piece it together. A hem is basically nothing more than a folded over edge on a piece of metal. It is used to finish off rough or sharp ends of the sheet metal and obviously it is also used to help strengthen and improve the appearance of the project. Okay, and when we are using an, a hem, we want to allow about a quarter of an inch of allowance for a hem. Okay, when using metal heavier than 22 gauge, you might want to increase that hem to somewhere around maybe 5 16 or maybe even 3 8 A double hem is a single hem that is basically repeated. It's folded over on itself. The double hem provides a much greater strength than a single hem. Where we would probably use some of these, these hems is maybe for air velocity, static pressure in the ductwork. If we have a lot of velocity and static pressure in the ductwork, we're going to want to make sure that this ductwork is capable of handling that. So we may run into having to put in what we call a double seam. It's just a reinforced seam to add some strength and rigidity to that piece of ductwork. Okay, double hems are generally somewhere between maybe 5 16 or 3 8 of an inch. Um, in length. You'll see on this picture here that we have uh, a reinforced edge hem. Uh, you will definitely be seeing a lot of that in your commercial uh, ductwork where we're definitely going to be using and moving an awful lot of air. Those types of hems and edges will add a lot more strength to the the ductwork so that you don't really hear it popping and then expanding and contracting. It pretty much makes it a nice solid 
a piece of ductwork for your for your air velocity. Your form after the hem, that is, could be another form of like a reinforced hem. It depends on what um, application you're using that for. Okay, to make a hem, you are going to use a uh, a seam. Okay, seams are used to fasten sheet metal sections together using locks, rivets, screws. In some cases, you may brazing or even soldering. Depends on what you're doing, okay? For sheet metal use, you are going to be using locks. You will be using rivets. You'll be using screws for the most part. They can be made by hand. You can use a sheet metal brake or a bar fold to make your seams. The type of seams made and the fastening method depends on the type of metal, again, its thickness and its fabricating machinery available to the worker. You're going to have times where you're going to be making seams out in the field. You're not going to be in a sheet metal shop to make all of your fittings. You're going to have to, in some cases, do it out in the field. You'll have a sheet metal break. You'll have your sheet metal cutters and, and tools, and you'll have to do it right there on the job site. There are a variety of seam types that have been designed for use in the sheet metal, and there are probably somewhere around 20 of them that are actually used in sheet metal ductwork and construction and are all used for all types of purposes. Okay, so in this picture here, we have a couple of examples right here. You have a single hem, you got a double hem, you got a single flange. Okay, you got a lap seam. You got an upside lap seam, a plain lap seam, double flange, single flange, double seam, grooved seam, standing seam, and a wired seam or a wired edge. Just to name a few. All of these seams have different applications and different uses. Okay, one of the most common ones that you're going to see and you're going to be making a lot of is what we call the Pittsburgh machine. The Pittsburgh is the most commonly used sheet metal seam that you're going to see in the shops. Okay, this seam has two parts, a single 90 degree lock and a pocket lock. Okay, the single lock is inserted into the pocket lock and after which the edge of the pocket lock is actually folded down and it creates a sealed seam. Your Pittsburgh seams are often used in many pieces of your HVAC ductwork. Okay, they can be formed on all gauge metal anywhere from four, 16 to 40 gauge metal. Okay, this seams, uh, the seam is easy to form on a handbrake or using what we call a Pittsburgh machine. There's a, a machine out there that will make the seam for you. All you have to do is just run the metal through the machine and it makes it for you. If you don't have that, you're going to have to make it by hand. A distinct advantage to the Pittsburgh machine is that it can be formed even on curves. If you are making a, P, uh, a 90 degree elbow, you can put a Pittsburgh machine on the heel and on the throat of that metal. Okay, so there's a lot of varieties and a lot of ways to use this, this, this seam. So to make this seam, the first thing that we have to do is we have to take our piece of sheet metal and we're going to put it in that sheet metal break. Okay, right here, this little image right here, this is our sheet metal break. Our metal is right here. And we're going to measure approximately one and a quarter inches. Okay, and we're going to make a 90 degree bend, one and a quarter inches high. Once we make that inch and a quarter, we're going to remove that metal from the brake, and we are now going to flip that metal over so that our 90 degree bend is now sitting flat within the brake. Okay, and now we're going to insert that metal into the longer portion against that leaf. And we are going to go in approximately maybe about, well, about a half inch from the edge of the brake to the edge of the, uh, the bar fold that is on there. And what we're going to do is we're going to bend that up. 
Okay, we're going to bend that up all the way so that we make a nice little curve, as you see here. Okay, and that curve is about about a half an inch or so, we'll say. Okay, once that is done, we again, we are going to remove that piece of sheet metal. We're going to stick it right back inside that break, and then we're going to bend that leaf up a little bit more, see, so that we have about three quarters of an inch. Once that is done, we are now going to take a rubber mallet or a sheet metal hammer, and we're going to fold that piece down so that we kind of make like a pocket right here. We're going to fold that down. And then to finish the job, all we're going to do is we're going to use the sheet metal uh, break to just kind of flatten it out and make it straight. So once that is done, you can now finish your pocket, straighten it out, do whatever you need to do to it, and then you can actually join your locks together. So basically what it looks like when it's completely done, you're going to have your 90 degree fold. This is one side of your metal. Here is your pocket, which is the other side. And all you're going to do is you're just going to insert your fold right into that pocket, and then you're just going to bend that extra piece of sheet metal down, and it creates a seam. So this is what it looks like on an actual piece of metal. So here's your pocket, this little extra piece right here. Your little fold is actually sitting right in here. So all you're doing is taking your sheet metal hammer, and you're just going to bend this down. Hammer it right down, make it all nice and flat. And then you have a finished Pittsburgh seam. Another seam that you're going to run into, which is also kind of common and pretty much recently like an innovation that they that has come out is your button punch snap lock seam. These are prefabricated pieces of metal that already have the seam already put onto the ductwork. Okay? These were originally the continuous snap lock was used on light gauge stove and furnace pipe to permit shipping um, like ease. You know, it's prefabricated stuff. Okay, the pipe section was then all snapped together. So you could kind of see in this image here that we already have, it's already a prefabricated Pittsburgh. Okay, what this one does, it has little buttons or like little snaps, snap locks that are on it. You form it pretty much the exact same way as your, your Pittsburgh, but this one, all it does, it just snaps into place. You don't have to fold any pieces of metal over. Okay, the button punch spaces, the buttons are, are approximately about two inches centers along the flange to be inserted in the pocket, and the continuous sharp fold on the pocket permits the button flange to be snapped into the actual pocket. So once this is all done, and this piece of metal is actually snapped into the pocket, it doesn't come undone it's permanently together. The only way that you're ever going to get that apart is if you pry it apart with maybe a uh, screwdriver um, and pry it apart. Usually when that happens, you damage it and the ductwork is pretty much just ruined. So if you're using a button punch snap lock, you're going to have to make sure that it is formed properly. You have to make sure that your edges are lined up and nothing is overlapping. Okay, so take time when you're dealing with these. Okay, the pocket and flange must be formed in a machine suited to the gauge of the metal being formed. If that is not adhered to, the pocket will be loose, and the stiffness and the air tightness will obviously be lessened or even lost altogether. Okay, on a final note, your button punch snap lock should not and is not recommended to be used on aluminum ductwork. You can only use it really on sheet metal. Another seam that we're going to deal with is your dovetail seam. Your dovetail seam is used to primarily on round or elliptical type pipes. It is seldom used on your rectangular duct. Okay, so you have a couple of different types of dovetails. You have your plain, your beaded, and your flanged type dovetails. Your plain dovetail seam is used to join a collar and a separate flange. This seam is made without rivets, screws, or even solder. Though instead, tabs 
are cut out the end of the collar and every other tab is then bent down. The separate flange is then added with the bent tabs holding it in place. And then the remaining tabs are then bent over the flange to secure it, just like this. Okay, so well, this is a piece of round pipe that say you're gonna use for a takeoff. Okay, what you would do is on one end of that pipe, you would just simply notch all the way around and then you would fold every other one out like this. Then you would stick this piece right into a piece of ductwork, the hole that you've already cut out, and then you would just fold the other seams to secure it to that piece of ductwork. You would then mastic it and then you would tape it to make sure that it is a completely sealed joint. Your lip se joint seams consist of the edges to be joined and a drive clip that joins them. The edges are turned to form pockets and then the edge on the drive clip are made from a separate piece of metal and are also turned to make pockets. So here are your slips and drives. Okay, so here is your lip. These are your lips. And then this would be your drive clip. So all you're doing is once the piece of metal is put together, these two lips kind of butt up against each other. And then you would just drive your drive across them to hold them together. Your duct reinforcement is another important part when it comes to making sure that your seams, hems, and joints are all properly put together. Without reinforcement, and when we're hanging that ductwork, those seams and stuff can fall apart. Remember, it's stress. Okay, so duct reinforcement is usually needed for all HVAC duct, and even more likely for reinforced rectangular duct systems. Okay, the specific reinforcement requirements depend on many factors, including the joint type that you're going to be using, the system air pressure, your gauge of the material, and the finished duct size. The bigger the ductwork, the more reinforcement you're going to need. Okay, because hey, ductwork has weight. Okay, so it's going to have to be reinforced in some way. Okay, all of these reinforcement requirements, these are set by industry standards. SMACNA, for example, and local and municipal building codes. So when we are putting in ductwork, we have to make sure that we are following the strict codes that are set by either SMACNA or your municipal and, I'm uh, sorry, and your municipal and local building codes. Okay, so for an example here, the manual HVAC duct construction standards, metal and flexible, which was published by SMACNA, which stands for Sheet Metal and Air Conditioning Contractors National Association. The specific SMACNA standards require systematic duct reinforcement. When such reinforcement is needed, it should be in accordance with SMACNA and or other applicable standards as necessary. Now notice with that code, it's pretty broad. It does not necessarily give you a specific but it's telling you that you need to make sure that your ductwork is being reinforced in accordance with SMACNA standards. Okay, the SMACNA book is pretty much the, the gospel of duct construction and what needs to be done and what cannot be done in regards to duct construction. Many forms of intermediate duct enforcement are in common use today such as your conventional angle, your Z-iron, and your channel iron. All of this stuff is uh, you, you purchase and you use it in accordance with local building codes to properly support and hang your ductwork. Okay, it's all prefabricated into rectangular reinforcement shapes or brackets and then positioned around the duct transversely to the direction of airflow. Thank <laughs> you.